Good morning. I am the pleasure of uh, chairing this session that is uh, dealing with uh, digital transition uh, inspired digital transformations. Uh, just to introduce the session, what is digital transformations is for us the changes that are happening uh, uh, in the economy and the society uh, as a result of the attempt and uh, integration of digital technologies in every aspect of uh, human life. Uh, the uh, impact of the transformation that uh, digitization is uh, bringing on, on board has been uh, already recognized for Europe in, um, in the white paper Future of Europe Harnessing Globalization that is basically recognized that, that these technologies are changing completely our life and are affecting basically all sectors like transport, energy, agri-food, telecommunication, uh, financial service, factory production, manufacturing, and, and health care, uh, which are the challenge of, uh, of uh, the progressive digitization of the society, it is, are two mainly. One is that uh, the technology is now very fast. Comparing to the past, the speed of the technology, uh, new technology are coming to the market and uh, are so fast in penetrating to the market that you don't have the time sometimes to regulate, to understand their input. And the second is uh, the pervas pervasiveness of the technology. Uh, if just to make an example, uh, energy, uh, ele electricity, to reach 25% uh, of population in US take more than 55 years. Now, smartphones are reaching the same population in less than three years. So, uh, and, and this kind of technology, smartphone, is not only for few uh, people, but is basically on the end of uh, five or six billion of, 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 of population. So, we cannot ignore that the technology cannot be only analyzed in, in, a, single, in a single sector, but we have really to understand the global impact. Uh, the section today has been organized to address this topic by looking from four different angles. Uh, we will start looking from the business perspective, how this technology can be used to create new innovation services. Then we move to a presentation about how to master these technologies, how to deal with technologies that is changing so fast, how we can be make a, a, a better use of existing and, and, and future technologies. Uh, the third presentation will be from the user perspective, so which is the impact of this technology in the local government? How the local governments are uptaking the technologies and changing their business practice? The last, but not least, will be about people, interaction of people and technologies, and the impact of technology on people. I believe that uh, this session and the four speakers that we have selected will provide very useful insight. And at the end of the fair presentation, there will be some questions that I will ask to them to be addressed with the three topics that I consider the more challenging today. So let me start with the first speaker. The first speaker is the well-known speaker, Alain de Tay. Uh, Alain uh, is uh, the head of, he was, ed, uh, was heading uh, Teleatlas, was one of the founder of uh, Teleatlas, that was a very uh, famous global map company and uh, f that was uh, acquired by TomTom Tom in, uh, in 1919. Now is a member of, is the more member of TomTom, Tom, and uh, he laid the foundation for a new innovative way to create real-time maps capable of powering the most demanding uh, applications, such, for example, autonomous drive in the future. Please, Alan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. When and if you want to solve a problem, you better make sure that you know what the problem is really about and that you analyze the facts before you start developing opinions. And that is uh, also true for solving one of the big problems that we have worldwide is mobility. We have uh, the intention to redesign our mobility. We have the intention to reduce congestion. We have intention to save the planet uh, by lowering the, the carbon uh, dioxide emissions, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
But we need to understand what the problem is really about, and that's where technology can actually help us. Uh, big data in particular uh, makes sure that you can have a right view about your infrastructure, about the usage of that infrastructure. What you see on the screen right now is the city of Berlin, and this is not a uh, animated map, this is actually probe data. These are GPS traces that are collected in a time frame, it's speeded up a little bit, of 24 hours. So from a blank sheet, after 24 hours, you have every little street in Berlin that is uh, displayed as you see. Uh, this is big data and I'll tell you a bit about it. First of all, we started with that big data collection in uh, 2008, that's roughly 10 years ago. And why we did it is uh, because of a user problem. The user uh, could know by then, because there were navigation systems, how to go from A to B, but the user was not capable of going from A to B in a congestion-free way, to avoid the traffic jams and so on and so on. So one of the first uh, applications of uh, the usage of our probe data was actually to get a, a realistic view of the real-time traffic. So how is the traffic condition on every single road? Now, in the meantime, we're 10 years further. We today collect probe information of 550 million devices worldwide. That's a staggering number. I'll give you more data about it but it's for sure that that leads to big data, which again allows you to analyze what the traffic and what the mobility problems are. And with that big data, we can actually not only generate real-time uh, traffic information, but also historical traffic information, which means that we have a clear data set on every street in the world, not every street in the world, but roughly every street in the world, uh, how fast you can drive on that street segment any time of the day, any day of the week, any uh, week of the year. And that's one thing. But we go further than that. We are actually capable of now predicting where you could park your car on the basis of probe data. We are uh, actually uh, predicting what the speed limits are. We are predicting what the traffic light cycles are, and that's all based on that uh, probe data. But in the meantime, we also use those probe data to actually update our maps, uh, and to update our maps in real time, so that you actually can, and I'll tell you more about it later on, that you actually can know what the changes are in the road infrastructure in real time. That's actually the holy grail of any map maker. Now, if you look at the amount of data, just to give you an impression, uh, it's dazzling figures, it's 19 trillion anonymous data points in total that we have in our files, and daily there's about 20 billion data points that come in. Now that doesn't ring a bell, uh, just to give you a kind of a feel what it means, the amount of kilometers that we collect per second is roughly the same as 10 times around the world. So we collect an amount of data that is 10 times around the world every second of the day. So um, that is a staggering amount of data and you have to have a uh, high level technology in artificial intelligence to be able to, to get out of that massive amount of data uh, information that is valuable for solving the problem ahead. Now, next to the big data uh, from probe information, uh, we are not the only ones that have big data. There are a, a number of organizations worldwide, both businesses as well as government agencies and cities, that have uh, data that is very valuable to add to that massive amount of data and those big data that are available in governments and in cities are frequently underutilized, unfortunately, because it's a wealth of data that if made available uh, for, uh, in an open way, 
or in an exchange between the government agency and the businesses would actually make the problem more clear and would, make, would give us much more clarity about the traffic and about the infrastructure. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So if we would know consistently where the roadworks are worldwide, we could not only avoid a lot of traffic jams, but we could also better pre-actually uh, change our maps. One very nice example of that this is really possible is an initiative which is called TNITS. It is an European initiative. Uh, it's largely in Scandinavia, but also Belgium and Ireland are participating. And it's about open data, making those data available. What you see on the right-hand side of the screen are speed limits. Uh, that change in the area of Stockholm. And it's the authority that basically collects those speed limit changes and makes them available to any third party that wants to have access, which gives you an enormous amount of information. Just to put a number on that, thanks to that initiative, we have been able to make two million changes over the past two years. Two million changes. So we know that the road infrastructure is changing continuously, and it's really important that we get to a real-time map and a real-time view on how the infrastructure is behaving and what is changing. Now, that TNITS uh, initiative is definitely something that is worth, worth following up in the future. There is possibility to exchange data between the business, like TomTom, and the government. And a very nice example of that is that any city in the world uh, has a traffic management problem. And traffic management uh, comes very close to utilizing the traffic data that we actually have. So what we do with cities is we make that traffic information available in exchange for their information uh, to make their information available to us, and we process it and we return it back uh, to the municipalities. I think those uh, multilateral uh, corporations are really essential to get to the point that we really understand what our infrastructure is capable of offering to the end user, to the consumer, to the driver. Now, if you look why we do uh, all of that, then the, as I said already in, uh, in the previous couple of sentences, the holy grail of map making and the holy grail of any end user that uses a map is a real-time map. That means, what is a real-time map? That means that actually any change in reality is happening in reality, is processed immediately, and is then fed back to the application of the end user. That sounds like utopia, that sounds like very futuristic, but we are capable of doing that. The architecture of our systems are capable of doing that. It's just the, the one problem to solve is to feed those systems with the relevant data. And there again, a cooperation between many parties can help feeding that beast so that actually the end user, you, have a up-to-date map and an up-to-date view on the, on the infrastructure. This is happening as we speak. We are using that information real-time. Traffic information is one of the, of the examples. But we're also using it, for example, to understand where the band turns are, where the one-way restrictions are. You can imagine if you know where the cars are driving that you can derive an enormous amount of information out of that uh, big data set. Now, that is what we, we are doing uh, for the moment. And just to give you an impression, in July and August, we, we changed, we made one point, in one month, we made 1.5, uh, 1.6 actually, billion uh, uh, modifications to the database, right? So the, that means that we process about 2 million map updates in an hour. That means that during my speech, we have made half a million changes to the database. So that is what big data does. And we're not the only company in the world that has access to big data sets. You have other companies like Google, like Apple, that have access to those data sets and are doing exactly the same. 
My plea here is to make sure that the government agencies and the cities collaborate in that effort and get in return a better understanding of their own infrastructure. You don't have to send out job students to measure traffic. We know the traffic in your city, whether that's Singapore, Tokyo, New York, or Madrid. And then last but not least, I wanted to uh, say something about the future of driving. Uh, we're all confronted with media uh, articles and uh, media spots about autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is a real thing. It's not a science fiction thing, it is happening as we speak. Actually, we do have a TomTom, -tom, an autonomous car in Berlin uh, that drives autonomously in certain circumstances. Not in all circumstances, and I know that everybody is scared to death to leave computers driving a car, but let me assure you, it's going to be as safe as planes that are also flo uh, flown uh, automatically. But, yeah, the road infrastructure, again, is the bottleneck. It's not the technology to make that car move. It is the technology to make sure that it moves safely over that infrastructure. And that means that the kind of mapping that we need to do of that infrastructure needs to be way more accurate than the maps that we currently use for, na for navigation. And again there, the big data collection comes in. And again there, also the, the, the cooperation with the, with the government and the cities is really important because they are in charge of the legislation and there needs to be a lot of legislative uh, adaptations to make uh, autonomous driving really work. Right? But they also sit on an enormous amount of information that is valuable for those autonomous cars to be more safely. We can handle the creation of the, what is called HD map. The HD map is actually a high definition map. It has accuracy of about uh, 10 centimeters. It, is, it has much more content than the maps that you currently use on, the, on your phone or in your navigation system. It is actually lane, it's a 3D lane model, so it's a three dimensions, which uh, in the old days was only two dimensions, and it is to the lane level uh, accuracy. If we want to make sure that those cars are safe, again, the big data and the arti artificial intelligence need to work together to make sure that the map that can actually give the autonomous car a view on what is coming, that that map is 100% up to date. You can afford a navigation mistake and then you're angry at your navigation system, but you cannot afford a uh, mistake when your car is driving you instead of you driving your car. So as a conclusion, I would say that big data offers a tremendous opportunity to uh, understand the problem we need to solve. And we need to solve that problem because our planet is going down the drain. I don't want to sound melodramatic, but cars are a problem. They are a, an opportunity for, for personal mobility, but they also are a problem and we need to solve that problem. I plead for anybody in this room, if you have data that are uh, helping to solve that problem, please don't sit on it. Talk to each other and make, let's make sure that we create a better world. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Alain. Uh, the next uh, presentation uh, will deal with uh, some technologic issues. Uh, the speaker will be Bart uh, de Lat Latover, Latover? Some of the, more or less, that is Director of Innovation Program in uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, and is responsible for planning and managing, uh, managing interoperability initiatives such as testbed, pilot, and as well interoperability experiment with a particular emphasis uh, on activity in Europe. Bart, the floor is to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Bartolomeo della Torre is also a pronunciation of my name in another language. <laughs> I know people struggle with that. <laughs> Great. Uh, just on the previous speaker on autonomous driving, uh, I get car sick when I, I don't turn the wheel. So I think I'm going to invest all my money into Dramamine, which is a car sickness medication, and spend the other half of my money on car washes. 
That's so when you don't get your money into drama need. Good. So it's an honor to be here for two reasons, is be part of this panel. It's also an honor that uh, my favorite band played here last year, Kraftwerk. And I'm pretty much standing here where Rolf Hutter should stand, so I thought that was really cool. So I was, I was sitting on the second row somewhere over there. So, great. With the city landscape of, uh, of Antwerp in the background, I hope you were able to enjoy Antwerp a bit. I, uh, I grew up here, so if you need uh, any places you want to go tonight, I was, I was mostly active in Antwerp in the, in the evenings. So if you need any help on that, you know, just let me know. But I'm not here for that. You wanted to hear from me how Inspire Smart Cities and digital transformation come together. Um, this is a mandatory slide. So when you talk about smart cities, you always have to give a definition. What is a smart city? Uh, to be honest, uh, two or three years ago, I had a perfect definition. Then I started a project on smart cities. And now I'm, I'm totally lost. I don't know it anymore, but it has something to do with ICT, communication, sensors, and, and bringing it all together. Or should we call it a future city? Uh, I don't know. Or there's another one that's called a connected city. We're here with the emphasis a little bit more on, on the sensors and to Alain's uh, previous presentation where everything is connected. And we, we're definitely going in, in that direction whether it's cars that connect, boats, pedestrians, everything will be connected, and, and even the human beings will, be, will, be, will become sensors in the future. Um, I'm just back from, from Kansas City. I came in uh, yesterday and attending the IEEE Smart City Conference, and I was able to uh, exchange some words with uh, the mayor from Kansas City on, on smart cities, and he said, you know, that's all fantastic what you do with technology and the connection and the sensors and all that much, but make sure you don't forget about the citizen. We do this for the benefit of the citizen. Please don't forget that. Don't be blinded by science, as Thomas Dolby used to sing, but uh, have an or technology push. As an engineer, it's so fantastic to work on these things. Uh, but uh, the mayor said, hey, I, I need to go to the grocery store every morning, and if something doesn't work in the city, they come to me. So whatever it is that you do, make sure you have the citizen uh, front and center. I think that's, that's really something that, that we should take away from this as well. So here's the definition that I use these days. Uh, I think a smart city is a city that can combine data sets that were not meant or designed for each other. Um, and we had a good example of this when the OGC ran a future city pilot uh, last year where we combined various data sets for the benefit of the citizen. So the example here is in uh, the borough of Greenwich in, in London where uh, we combined fast moving sensor data, humidity, uh, outside temperatures with slow moving data from, from the city. Uh, what we were able to do is, is there was a correlation between building humidity and elderly people dying too soon. Um, weird topic, um, but if we could do preemptive maintenance in the buildings that they could, what they called, reduce winter death. Um, and so that's the, the, the benefit if we can bring all those data sets together to, uh, to my definition. Fortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, a lot of the smart city solutions uh, that, that cities buy at this stage are very silo driven. What I mean by that is from, from the sensor or the data capturing towards there where the data is kept and the applications that use it, it's a silo. The data can hardly get out. And so big cities get big silos, and smaller cities get smaller silos. Um, but it is, it is an issue, but not a problem. European Commission to the help. The, the European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities and Communities. And what this initiative does, and, and I, I, I firmly believe in this, and that is that the there, there's no funding here, um, is that the European Commission is using their convening power to bring together the cities and the industry, or as it states here, the demand side and the supply side. 
I mean, the interesting bit for me coming from a standardization organization, the OGC, is that the commission wants to see this based on open standards. Uh, I very much applaud that. Uh, <laughs> and, and so this group here, the, the EIPSCC, has produced uh, uh, some documents. If you uh, take a picture of the QR, it'll take you straight into uh, the documents. And um, I think this, this is a great initiative. Um, so if, if you're interested, if you are a city and you would like to participate, uh, there's a letter of intent. If you are from the industry and would like uh, to participate, there's an MOU. If you're interested, come and see me. Uh, I gladly uh, help you uh, out with this. So what they do is, is they, the, the commission provides a neutral platform for the cities and the industry to come together so that the industry or the city can express, hey, this is what we need, and that the industry can build something that they can sell. It's a great combination. Um, there is a funding mechanism uh, where, where the commission uh, funds about 100 million a year on four lighthouse projects that uh, focus on the digital transformation. Uh, so taking the cities where they are today towards uh, those connected uh, cities. So again, uh, free plug for the commission here and, and the lighthouses. So if you're a city, you are you got to be interested in this. Uh, as for the standards, there's uh, Sport Action. Uh, it was a project named Espresso, which I was voluntold <laughs> to lead, and with all pleasure, that focuses on the use of standards in smart cities. And I'll be talking about that in the afternoon. So it's a free plug for myself here. Um, Here's a slide from the EIPSCC, and I did not come up with this one because then it would be suspicious, but read out number, uh, the key findings number one and two. Cities, eh, they're hesitating where to go, but look at number two. This is where the digital transformation still in some way needs to happen. I mean, Alan's presentation was fantastic, but I think he's somewhat ahead of the curve. Uh, whilst the smart cities are maybe a little bit behind, somewhat harsh to say, I'm not sure. Um, but definitely, they, uh, there's a long way to go. And then when you look at number three, I particularly like this one, and that is in, in cities, the urban platforms or the smart city platforms have very much a place-related uh, service or, or, or things. So location, we all know location, location, location is important. And, and here it's being recognized by the cities. This is important because I'm gonna to point to this in my conclusion. Um, so, uh, city of Rotterdam, just north of, uh, of Antwerp, you see the, the, the variety of data sets and, and data systems that they have, like any other uh, city. But important is that they use their GIS as a window on the city information. Even better, they have recently updated their 3D version of the city. Um, and they, they truly believe that you have to have that 3D version of the city, the so-called digital twin idea. Um, so that the interaction between the city of Rotterdam and the citizen becomes more digital. And especially, I believe, with the youngsters that, that live and breathe with their their smart device, the services that they provide uh, to folks from my age will be very different, or and their interaction will be very different uh, with, with the younger folks. And, and so the city of Rotterdam is really taking that on um, at heart here. The 3D, uh, actually when, when they started to build uh, the 3D models and they showed that to the city representatives, they, re they, they uh, gave a license to have a building built somewhere, and then they realized, like, oh, no, you know, it's way too high. They didn't see that in the 2D uh, representation of the city, so 3D does help. So, I truly think that, that Inspire and, and Smart City share a lot of that interoperability arrangements and infrastructure. And I, I claim that based on the fact that for cities, location, is, is very important. And the fact that they look at their GIS departments to unlock all that data that the city sits on. And those interoperability arrangements are exactly the same that we, we build here in, in Inspire. 
And then I hear, of course, the mayor from Kansas City saying, Bart, you know, don't forget about the citizen dude. So I have that here uh, as well. A uh, quick thank you to Stan Hudertier for something that he tweeted as I was not here on the first day. And that was uh, Doreen uh, Birmania really focused by it, uh, what Inspire is for. You can, uh, you can read it here for yourself. Uh, but it's for that sustainable environment, sustainable development. Cities have a big role to play in the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. Um, so they better get their act together to, uh, to support that. And I believe that going hand in hand with, uh, what, with the work that is being done in Inspire is, is great. Inspire went through a, a painful period. I think we all felt that pain one way or the other. And, and that can be to the benefit of cities that, that take on this because it's the same interoperability arrangements. And so that we can set them up for success and that they participate in sustainable development. I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Mart. Now we move to the third presentation uh, that uh, will look different from, from the previous one because uh, we'll uh, look from uh, the user perspective. So what uh, the local government uh, is, uh, is uh, is, do, is doing to, to, to be sure that this technology can really be used as innovation. The speaker will be Senin Bergen Clausen, that is the project manager for the city of Helsingborg in Sweden. And uh, since uh, 2017, she represents the city of Helsingborg in the urban agenda for the EU partnership on digital transition. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Selin Bergen Clausen, and as you just heard, uh, I work for the city of Helsingborg in Sweden. Um, we're one of the partners in uh, the Urban Agenda for the EU Partnership on Digital Transition. Um, and normally when I do presentations, I start by saying uh, it's funnier if we have a dialogue. So if you have anything to ask or to say or to add or anything, just raise your hand or shout it out. I realize that it might be difficult because it's so big, but uh, feel free. Um, I don't know how much you know about the Urban Agenda for the EU, but it's a program consisting of 12, 12 different partnerships, um, and it aims to, uh, to really put the urban dimension in focus when speaking about, um, or when considering new EU policies or legislation or programs or funding. Uh, and these partnerships, um, they approach different challenges that we all uh, face. So for example, there is a partnership on air quality or urban poverty, migration, there is uh, mobility, and then there is the one that we're a part of, uh, digital transition. So what we do is we try to, um, try to divide it into three different pillars or um, um, well, basing our uh, suggestions for actions on, on these pillars, which, is, which are better regulation, better funding, and better knowledge. And these are the partners in the partnerships. As you can see, it's a majority of cities or municipalities. There are also some member states, uh, some European networks, CMR and Eurocities. We have, we're lucky to have ERBAC, and Committee of the Regions, and then some directorates generates from the European Commission. I hope that you can see, I see that the text is a bit small, but just a brief timeline. We started in uh, 2016 with the application and then we started the, the work in February of 2017. So we have been working on identifying bottlenecks, uh, considering digital transition um, from a local authority perspective. Um, we transformed the bottlenecks into different actions, uh, we prioritized the actions, we presented them, uh, we completed the action plan, um, we published it for public hearing, and then we elaborated on the feedback that we received, and finally 
in June, just uh, a few months ago, we got the endorsement from the Commission. And now we're in September and we will start implementing the, the actions. So just briefly an overview of our action plan and how, uh, and how it fit, fits together the actions. So what we want to do is we want to generalize and diffuse the digital skills to everybody, uh, both in a way that we can measure uh, how well we are progressing um, in terms of citizen inclusion or citizen digital inclusion, but also in public authorities. We want to enable and implement citizen-centric e-government, so we want to, um, to provide modules or blocks that we can share across local authorities in Europe so that we can all uh, have the same, the same e-participation uh, platform, for example. And we want to also be able to measure progress not just between member states, but also um, inside the member states. And of course, when speaking about digital transition, data is a huge, huge question. So this is where we have, uh, at least personally, I think, because I work with data, this is the, the, the important part of the action plan. So we want to be, uh, to be sure that we speak the same language when speaking about data. Um, we want to make sure that we can use private sector data in terms of um, using it for, for public good or, um, or when working in, in, the, in the public sector. Um, we want to look at how digitalization can affect and transform urban planning, specifically, when, uh, specifically in terms of participation. Um, and we want to look at my data, and my data is a huge topic that could really use uh, a full day or a full conference just by itself. But in short, it's about um, putting back the control of your data to the citizen and how, we, how the citizen can, can choose to, uh, to share or not to share its data, for example, for, pub for public good uh, or for developing new services and so on. And then we want to, to accelerate the, and adopt digital emerging technologies. Uh, we want to look at factors for enabling in innovation and uh, trying new technologies and, and making sure that we are aware of the different legislation or the different uh, standardizations that exist and uh, storing and collecting of data and so on. And then we of course want to look at new, new business models because you, I guess, as you all are aware, uh, less people needs, need to do more in the future, also in the public sector, or specifically in the public sector. So we want to look at how we can really do this together. So um, the action that I have been the most involved in is the one with also the longest title. It's called Specification and Monitoring of Standardized Planned Land Use Data for Formal and Informal Urban Planning Participation Processes. And what we identified when we spoke about digitalization in urban planning is that there are lots of bottlenecks. Uh, it's about when you do a public hearing of a plan, you, you get some feedback, hopefully digi digitally, but also uh, in analog meetings and settings, and how do we collect it and how do we store it, how can we use it in a smart and effective way. Um, there are no standards for this data and there are different legal uh, regulations in different nations, so that we have uh, just a, a minor pool of entrepreneurs or, or businesses that can, that can provide us with different services. Um, Digital, to, digital tools or emerging technologies such as VR and AR and open data and crowdsourcing platforms, they are key factors, but resources are missing, both in terms of finances, but also in terms of how do we use it, how do we understand data, um, and so on. And so the objective of this action is to define the guidelines for providing standardized spatial planning data, which can be, which can be implemented in, in informal and formal participation processes, and also to develop a transferable model that we can share throughout the EU, um, where we can look at how, how can we 
form uh, or create an urban, uh, a participatory urban platform um, uh, by including new content um, and different business models related to it and so on. So we can see that the action will increase knowledge in new types of data and how to use it for urban analytics. And this is really essential as we have the mutual challenges in the EU. Uh, and if we can compare, for example, planned land use in a, in a smart and effective way, we can also see specifically where we need to, uh, to put our resources in, in also in a smarter way. The decisions that we make will also be more evidence-based and they will be more democratic. And so there are two aspects of it. The first one is the standardization of data, which is more related to the INSPIRE directive. Um, and in this aspect, we want to evaluate and look at how, how is it actually used, the PLU data model throughout the EU, because as far as we know, the ones in the partnership, it's not as widespreadly used as we would wish it to be. And why is that? And how can we make, uh, make it more adapted to new types of data and specifically participatory data so that we can really make use of, of citizen opinions or other actors' opinions when we make decisions? And how can we make sure that the exchange of data in the planning process is as speedy and as lossless as possible? And the other aspect of the action, which is really my, um, my heart question, is how can we use or make use of digitalization to really transform the, the urban planning process in itself? As in, if you look at, um, if you look at the, the foundation or the, the basis of making decisions in urban planning, um, we have now throughout the EU, there are municipalities and cities that don't even have interactive maps or they have very outdated data, for example. And how can we make sure that the, the foundation of making decisions are as evidence-based as possible? And how can we make this piece of pie, in a way, consist of historical data and real-time data, for example, we can see air quality rise and they fall throughout the day and we can see the traffic stockings and where do people actually move and where do we have to make better decisions in order for us to, to create a smart city and to create a livable city and, and increase the quality of life for, for the citizens uh, without them having to actually come to us and say that we have a problem with this street or this this lane here, or the, the air is always bad in this corner, and so on. Um, so this, this, this collection of different types of data, we have, have the, uh, the academic background of the, the, of the city officials, the real-time data, the historical data, and also the citizens' actual opinions, the ones that come up to us and, to, and say what they wish. And this model or this type of, uh, of platform, we will look at um, how we can fund it and how we can make sure that it's also economically sustainable. Uh, we have to make sure that, that the different data providers also get something back from using it. We talked, uh, you talked a bit about open data before, which is also a, a hard question for me. Um, so, yeah. So what, um, what we believe is that this action, um, or one of the major impacts of this action is effective and inclusive urban planning processes. And we argue that by opening up uh, both the, the processes itself and the ability to contribute your own data, your own opinions and, and private sector data, and also for us to give back public sector data, um, the decisions that we make will become more transparent, more effective, uh, more democratic. And we also open up for innovation if we can have the same type of processes or you can recognize it throughout the EU. Then we also 
hopefully someday get rid of the problem that we only have a, a small pool of vendors that we can choose between uh, from a local perspective, because then we get the, the issues such as vendor lock-ins, and I'm sure there are many of you who, are, who recognize this. And so we're looking still, even though we started implementing uh, the, the actions, we're still looking for partners who are interested in, in joining. Uh, there are many ways that you can do this. Um, so if you're interested in, in specifically action eight, then you can contact me or my colleague from, from Hamburg, which is my co-action leader, Dr. Stefan Höfken. Or you can contact uh, directly the coordinators of the partnership itself, Kadri from Estonia, Mika from Oulu in Finland, and Veronica from Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm sorry if I missed anyone who waved their hands, but I don't think I did. <laughs> there were no questions. So. Thank you. Thank you, Selim. Now uh, we move to the last uh, speaker in, uh, in this session, that is uh, Valerie uh, Grant. Uh, she's a founder and managing director of Geotech Vision and the executive chairman of the Marley Technology Park, but is also the director of the World Geospatial Information Council, in particular responsible for partnerships and engagement. Good morning. I want to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to speak at this year's stage, and we have a very interesting topic, and we've had interesting speakers thus far. Ladies and gentlemen, we really live in a unique moment in history where the pace of the technological change is evolving at an exponential rate, and the speed of the digital transformation is unprecedented. The lines between the physical and the digital is blurring, or has been blurred, and our future is digital. Every business, big or small, has to transform, and smart entrepreneurs are looking to the opportunities that these developments could mean for their businesses, as well as organizations. Smartness is being embedded in everything with the aim of increasing efficiencies, and forward-thinking organizations are embracing what I like to call smart change, and they realize that they must disrupt or be disrupted. There is a wave of change, and the new digital era is the fourth industrial revolution. And it is transforming the way we live and the way we work. So, what is this digital transformation, though? Well, the digital transformation is the approach by which organizations are really driving their business models and ecosystems by leveraging the digital competencies that exist. It's real and it's happening right now. And organizations are adopting to changes in their ecosystem and they're leveraging digital technologies to create enhanced customer-centric businesses and the models that create unique customer experiences, and add to the bottom line. And there are several technologies that are fueling that digital transformation. And these include things like your AR and your VR, your cloud, your automation, the internet of things, and some of the things that we've heard about this morning, like big data. So for organizations to thrive in this digital economy, they must learn then to develop and execute a vision of digital transition or transformation. They must have a work plan that is aligned with their strategic objectives, and they have to take an ecosystem approach to delivering products and services. And they need to build that culture of innovation and create flexible and reliable human resource models and optimize the business processes for efficiency, quality, and agility. We've heard it that the amount of data we are producing every day is truly mind-boggling. There is 2.5 quintillion bytes of data that is created each day. Alan told us that 550 million devices, probes, are collecting data, and that in two hours, there have been about 2 million updates. This is truly mind-boggling. The pace is only accelerating with the growth of the Internet of Things. 
And it's even more mind-boggling to think that over the last two years, on alone, 90% of the data that exists on our Earth was generated. It exceeds four billion and half of the world, which is half of the world's population. The internet has become the universal source of information for billions, millions of persons. So, the most suave executives use data-driven insights to propel their, their fast decision-making. And so the most competitive organizations or industries, government or otherwise, are transforming their core business practices by tapping into something that is called location. Location is really at the center of what we're talking about. And so businesses are really discovering that hidden value in their data, that location intelligence, that location data, the power of where is especially valuable to organizations today. And in an era where we're connecting billions of data producing products like our assets or buildings or devices, you've heard some of them this morning, each with a unique location, the need to use this kind of location intelligence to discover the hidden value in the data is continuously growing. And location analytics and real-time data is leading to a broad array of applications ranging from optimizing your supply chain management to using real-time field updates for utilities to advance customer analytics for your retailers, to just name a few. The reality is that this, this change is driving better business models. It's integrating business processes. It's causing rapid adoption, and it's causing greater agility and flexibility. It's transforming the way we do business, and it's growing the way we do business. It's growing our ecosystem to, to have new ventures, and location data is permitting all kinds of processes. Consumers are the ones who are driving the direction. Location really gives us that data context and on everything that customer is buying, their buying habits, the moment they move an asset. And GIS powered location intelligence is really combining this data into multiple layers um, like customer relationship management, business intelligence, and we've seen many examples of that. But Part of my presentation focuses on the people element. How has that become a challenge? So innovation activities in our organization rarely require human capital with the ability to generate and apply knowledge and ideas. In fact, many studies have shown that the innovation is at the center of the organizational level in terms of their workforce qualifications and also their expenditure and training. So highly skilled workers are thought to be more apt at generating ideas and adopting technologies to make improvements on existing products and processes. And it is therefore important for us to understand that link between human capital and the innovation that accelerates this digital transformation. The reality is that digital transformation is not purely a technological endeavor. It is more a socio-technical thing. And so it's, there has to be a unique approach to addressing the inevitable issues that comes when we're dealing with people. And so there has to be multiple touch points. Digital transformation is what I like to call cultural transformation. It's a transformation that happens when we organize people in ways that allow them to effectively adopt to that change. The transformation has to occur in our organizational culture, in our people, and or processes, and everything that touches the customer and their interaction with their brand. So successful digital transformation really starts at the top of an organization. It is where the persons who are leading that charge, they're responsible for strategizing and they're responsible for creating those organizational goals and convincing the others to co-create that future with them. And so why is understanding all of this important, you may ask? Well, it allows us to really build that synergism among our stakeholders. It also allows us to identify processes of interrelationships that are compatible and reliable and effective and trusted in terms of social and human systems. And it allows us to understand the issues 
the barriers, the gaps, and the processes that cause inadequate or incompatible human system integration, that human interoperability element that I speak of. So when we really think of it, our goal really should be to be transformative, to give our employees a clear vision, but to give them the flexibility to innovate. So if we want to really focus in any organization on what the pillars of growth would be, then I think there are three entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship if you're within certain organization and even within government, technology and innovation. We need to focus on our business and not the technology because technology removes the obstacles and you know what, they increase our capability. But that's the easy part. We need to focus on how we can enhance the experience of the customers that we serve, whether this be internal customers or external, and we need to streamline our operations and transform our business model. So transforming that business model really requires that we move outside of our comfort zone. We create that culture of innovation, have the right talent, meet our user needs, and I like to think we need to start small. So if we should think of an engagement model, then it means that we would want to discuss the specific technology that we are looking at, having done some kind of a requirements analysis and explore how this benefits our end users. Then we become hands-on with that technology and really create some kind of demo for that and have our first project associated with the organization. And then it would be time for us to scale up. So start small and grow quickly. We need to engage the challenges of change. And so the future is both challenging, but it's exciting and it's positive. I personally believe that everyone can and should benefit from the promise of a digital future. And so the challenge is for us to go far beyond what we do today. It's for us to think that the future is digital and we are on the verge of something special and there are opportunities galore. We need to move from selling products to providing solutions and creating real value to our customers, whether this be internal or external, growing the lines of sinking or industry trends, and understand the value of location. We also need to create an organizational culture and DNA that is consistent with innovation and recognize that data is the new global currency and that there are new ways to find answers to all problems and there is a democratization of technology, and we need to manage that human interoperability. Digital transformation, ladies and gentlemen, is more than a buzzword. It is inspiring, fearless innovation. It is already bringing numerous benefits to our organizations that choose to embrace that small change, or smart change, rather. And so, they're experiencing improved issue tenses, improved decision making, improved customer engagement and experience, greater profitability, and it's helping governments to achieve SDGs. There is, however, no single magic formula for this. And so staying, it means that organizations need to realize that staying relevance means moving from yesterday's paradigm, and we cannot use the same solutions to the new problems we're having. It's time for us to disrupt. And there's no finish line. Digital is always evolving. But our responsibility is to truly understand where the value of digital transformation lies within each of our individual organizations. And so yesterday I saw a sign uh, in the lobby that says Antwerp is a city dominated by a great conviction that you can always do things slightly differently. So I charge you, let us embrace smart change and do things differently. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Valerie, for this inspirational talk. And, and now I, I would like to start uh, asking some questions on, on the issue that I see I recognize that we're uh, touch in your presentation. I, I'm happy to see that uh, in, some, uh, in some era there is a convergence of ideas and uh, still with uh, uh, some diversity. Uh, the first question is about uh, access to data. Uh, you are mentioning in your presentation that we are working in a data-driven society and the access to data has been recognized as a crucial to, new, to develop new innovative, new innovative services. 
Uh, we are uh, now aware that uh, as far concerned public sector data, uh, this is regulated already by some directive like uh, the Public Sector Information Directive, PSI directives, and as well the Inspire Directive as far concerned uh, special data. Uh, but uh, the access to private sector data is still uh, under intensive discussion, as you know, in the Commission, in the data package published in, uh, in, uh, in, um, before the summer, uh, is identified that is an area in which we need to work. This has been recognized also in, in the French government in the discussion on artificial intelligence that uh, are coordinated actions to ensure that access to business data, to private, uh, to private data for public uh, services is the key. And uh, we have example. We have example in which, uh, for example, the access to private sector data, like uh, data from car manufacturers, was making open to ensure that uh, the repairing market can be developed and you are not obliged to repair the mar your car in only on the brand, of, on, the, on the agency, uh, on the official image by the brand. Uh, but today, when I look into a discussion about connected car, and I'm looking to Alain in this case, I see uh, a position paper from the European Car uh, Association that is foreseen to give uh, access to, to the data for safety reasons. So the car data co uh, that will be collected by connected car should be accessible for safety reasons, but is not saying clear uh, condition for, for example, real traffic management that we mentioned is one of the key applications. So we have initiative running at the European, uh, uh, under the European Union about the free flow of data, and we are also in the firm of the, what is called the reverse PSAI, looking at, uh, we have recently created a working group on business to government data to develop uh, appropriate guidance. So I would like to, uh, to see which is your view, and if you have a magic solution to overcome these problems, in order that data from the business sector can be assessed by the private sector in future in a, in a easy, uh, in a way, harmonized, harmonized way. Alain, I think you are the first. Um, well, it's all about uh, what, what the previous speaker said about the data, it's a currency, right? And uh, so you deal with a currency that means you give and you take. Uh, that's true also for businesses. Businesses have the intent to either license their data or to trade that data for other data. I think in the latter uh, example, this is a very promising area where businesses and uh, governments could work together. There's a lot of data that the governments have that would be valuable to improve the products and the services of businesses. And the other way around, there's enormous amount of data that businesses have that could be interesting to do, for example, traffic management. And we have some, uh, at TomTom, we have some clear examples of that, where we traded uh, traffic management data for a city. In return, we get uh, better updates of what is going on in the infrastructure of the city. So I think barter deals and using data as a, as a currency, there's nothing dirty about it. it I, I think it solves a problem that needs to be solved. Valerie, you want to touch? Well, yes. Uh, as was said, I sincerely believe that data is a currency, as was said. And I believe that if we open the data and you start treating it in that way, that's the way we're going to leapfrog that innovation. Because it's only when you start realizing what exists, then you start realizing how you could use what exists to solve some of our most enduring problems. So I think it's important that we recognize that. And in so doing, we would be closer to, to really tapping into real solutions and providing inno innovative um, solutions to these problems. Uh, do you want to say also something? Because this is, you mentioned also in, a, in the digital transition, there will be one of the elements that is needed. Yeah, I mean, I can only agree. Uh, I see this as uh, the new form of comparative advantages, but instead of having uh, geographical um, uh, differences in production, we instead have sectoral differences in collecting data. So everyone wants to be effective and everyone wants to be smart and there is nothing smart about collecting uh, the same types of data where you can instead uh, vary and, and trade it if there are in incentives for doing so, and I, and I really believe there is. 
and maybe uh, Bart, you can elaborate about which is the technology that is uh, facilitating the, the sharing of data between uh, different platforms or, or, or different sectors. Yeah. <clears throat> Before I do that, uh, quickly responding to what I heard, and maybe it's more of a question than, than a statement, but does the public sector have a monopoly on the authoritative and authentic data? as we bring in public data into that equation that could have a hidden agenda or drive in it. Again, I'm not the person here with that knowledge. I'm just cautious uh, with this. Uh, to answer the question of, of access to data, I think standards or it, uh, are, are, are play a crucial role in, in getting seamless access to data without too many hurdles. Um, data can only be truly open if it's fully understood. Um, looking into the future, uh, Valerie, as you pointed out, in the innovation, and, and uh, looking at technology as well, I think semantic technologies will play a huge role. I've been to many Inspire conferences, and I only see an increase, exponential increase, in references to semantic uh, interoperability, so I think that's a key to unlock that data as well. And then, of course, moving to Alan's point in, in the massive amount, so we're talking about real-time streams, and we have to deal with those differently as we do with the, let's say, more slow-moving data. Uh, okay, you're anticipating my second question, is exactly about uh, which uh, innovative architecture we have to, to think about, because when the concept of uh, spatial data infrastructure was introduced was uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, at that time, we were clearly uh, thinking that uh, the only practical solution was interoperability of web services. But today, uh, Alain showed that we are talking about trillions of data that uh, uh, clearly uh, require a different conception and, and different architectures. Uh, in addition, today uh, is not only data from uh, the public government that we are dealing with, uh, or not only data from the business sector, we are dealing with a lot of data collected by citizens, or posted by citizens on social media, and as well uh, data collected by uh, device uh, in, 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 the, in the IoT, uh, IoT explosion with billion, billion devices in a few years. Uh, so I, uh, I will start again with Alain. Uh, how you are preparing or already dealing with these massive uh, datafications, and uh, if you are to look to the evolution of, uh, in terms of architecture and services, what is your forecasting today? Uh, that's a difficult question, but uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to give an answer. Uh, one of the things that has changed massively with regard to data uh, from the past to the present is that in the past, uh, and you call it slow-moving data, uh, you can also call it batch data. Uh, data was typically processed in a batched way. And that's not what we need going forward. Uh, there is a massive turnaround needed uh, from batch data sets to interactive data streams. And what we actually want in order to satisfy the real-time needs of the end consumer is data streams that are continuous rather than batch. So from an architectural point of view, that basically changes the whole infrastructure arch architecture where, with which you uh, collect and distribute the, the data. And the second argument is the amounts of data are staggering. And they're so big that if you want to transport that amount of data, uh, you get bandwidth issues. Uh, a very simple example is uh, a future car already today, uh, all the data that is uh, created in a car cannot be transmitted over the air. It's just too much. And so what, we, what you will get is more local uh, in the IoT, edge computing and all of that so that the data is actually prepared and already analyzed in the car itself or in the device itself before it's transmitted. I think those are the two big yeah. technology trends. Yeah, but I think that mm -hmm. you have also a chat on that. Yeah, so quickly reacting to Alan said, so we had the trends that started 10 years ago to move everything into the cloud is, we're gonna come back to the client. <laughs> uh, it's, it is uh, 
coming all back, fantastic. Um, so real-time uh, data streams, absolutely they're there. Um, as to the SDIs that we now know, I think they're here to stay, but we're gonna add components to it to accommodate for the fast-moving data. Uh, we're gonna see event-driven architectures. They're there today, but they will democratize big time. Uh, within the OGC, we're, we're, we're debating these, and, and we have emerging standards on uh, PubSub, MQTT, and, and all that uh, stuff is, is happening today, and they will democratize faster, to your point, Valerie, uh, that everything moves so much faster. Um, we've definitely got a handle on it in, in the OGC. Um, you mentioned the edge. There, there's cloud computing. Now we're bringing that to... Uh, closer to the devices where, where you also have comp uh, computing capacity. So cloud, edge, fog, definitely uh, going in that way. And I think from a standards point of view, we're, uh, we're following those trends. Uh, we can't be before the trend. That's, that's, that's ridiculous from a standard point of view. But we do see these activities as well. So we, we, we try to be as fast as technology uh, can, can do. Uh, because we are also uh, we need to take also into account the environment and dimension. What I would like to, to tell to the audience that uh, uh, the current uh, uh, supercomputing or, or, or pro intensive processing that big data are, are creating, as a consequence, uh, a strong consumption of energy. So 1.8% uh, of the energy is, is consumed in US for the data centers. And this is only increasing because we saw that the, the data availability is increasing exponentially every, every year. So now they are really thinking about a measure to minimize energy consumptions. One of the solutions that you mentioned, both, is the, to process the data on the edge or to process the data on the fog. Uh, and the quantum technology in the future. So these are the, the, the future trend. But as well, there are something that can be done today, like a new chip. And then we have a new chip that are much more powerful and much more energy saving. So this is technology will penetrate and probably in your transform in the future, you will have already data processing capacity mm. and the same in your car. Your car will become probably more powerful than a mind frame when I start to do my thesis. Uh, and then it's something that we have to deal. So because things are progressing so quickly that uh, you cannot imagine that how these are transforming the society. Uh, please. <laughs> Quick reaction to quantum computing. We know the exact moment when quantum computers are going to uh, come online because they will mine the bitcoins within a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't bother mining them right now. Yeah, you, you mentioned, for example, blockchain or, or, yeah. or, or um, crypto, crypto coin that is consuming enormous amount of energy. So from the ener energy point of view, it's absolutely not sustainable. But again, uh, let me go to the, to the third question that I have, because uh, it was quite interesting in, in some message from Alain, some message from... Um, Celine and, and, and in particular strong emphasis on, on value representation about which are the new business models. So in particular, Valerie was uh, really uh, showing that these technologies are creating new business model opportunities that were not the same that we have a long time ago. So let, let, let me say uh, something about uh, the public sector. No? Uh, the first uh, impact of ICT technology in the public sector was generating opportunity that were classified under the label called e-government. E-government action were mainly aimed to make, uh, uh, to replace paperwork with uh, digital, digital services. It was not really changing the way in which government worked, but only replacing uh, something to be done uh, manually with something that is more automated. Today, uh, we are, we are uh, considering the second wave uh, of impact of digital technologies and uh, that is creating an opportunity in which ICT technologies are not on, are used to innovate public services, to create a new services that were not existing before. It's not just uh, automatization processes, but it's really creation of something that uh, is different. And for me, one of the most interesting dimension is the, the fact that uh, this allow the government, the local government in particular, 
to better interact with the business sector, and we have a clear example of, in the presentation of Alain, but as well with citizens. So, and then you are also addressing in your presentation that we need also to, have, to address the human dimension on how to make people prepared to, to the new opportunities. So again, uh, from your perspective, you are already touching by these things, uh, what would be uh, the best way uh, to uh, advance or speed up uh, the projects of innovation in, uh, in, 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 and develop new, new business models? Because there is a cultural issue, but it's, not only, it's also a business issue, how you have establishing partnership and so on. So maybe you want to start first, Celine? Um. Yeah, I think definitely this is uh, very much a cultural issue. I think that many, uh, uh, many city officials are not used to, uh, to consider the business uh, perspective. I think that I, uh, we have the, the privilege of putting the citizen in focus and, and concern about the security of the citizen and the life quality of the citizen. And, and oftentimes I think that we forget that businesses or the private sector are also an, uh, a, an active actor in our environment that we should also foster and, and make sure that they have the right uh, conditions to, to, to grow and to innovate and to do it um, together with us. And so I think for the most part, I think actually it is a cultural question that we're just not used to... Um, um, to collaborate. Yeah. Uh. So my take on it is that um, we live in a place where we have not only digital natives, but there's just such a proliferation of the technology. And so everybody has a smartphone and it's the first thing that we touch when we wake up in the mornings and that is, it's consuming us. And so the reality is that we have what I like to call a fast food consumption of whatever it is that we're doing. And so we don't want to walk into a government office. We want to be able to access it on the thing that is now, we're now joined at the hip to. That's the thing that we really want to access in from. And so if we're able to build for that, then it means that we would be offering our citizens greater benefits and greater convenience. But one of the things that we would have to do and governments would have to do is to build the awareness surrounding that and also to make sure that persons are sensitized to how they can benefit from the use of that and quickly have figure that citizens will fall in place because they recognize the benefits that they can be gained from it. Alain? Yeah, I, I come back to what I said earlier. So the business model for, um, for governments and so on and so on, it's, it's not really my, uh, my thing. Uh, but uh, they have to combine, at one end, the advantages of being more open and to give more access to, uh, to data. Uh, they have to see that in the framework of uh, doing what is need to be done for, for their citizens. Uh, governments have, and, and cities are, uh, along, have a, a big need for data that is coming from the industry, but they also have a big need to distribute the results of the analysis of that data towards their citizens. If they are not going to do it, then uh, organizations like Google are going to take over. And I'm not sure that that's a good idea. Yeah, Mark? Let me uh, react to that, Alan. I think you, you hit on a, an important point. Uh, I see activities in Rotterdam where they, they help their small and medium enterprises, the local shops in town, to become uh, digital natives. Because if they don't do it, if, what is a city without the local shops when they are taken over? You, you mentioned Google. What about Amazon? You see the desert that they create in the United States in small cities. That is something that is a short-term action, but they need to, you know, small, medium enterprise, and they're taking, the, I don't want to turn this into a negative, but they, they're taking that action from the city to enable the small shops to have an online store, to have a, a representation in the digital twin of the city so that the citizen goes there and not immediately to the, the big mastodons of, of the world. Uh, 
Thanks. Uh, there, in, in, uh, in the presentation of uh, uh, Valérie, uh, you, you make a reference to my data, but, and then uh, I would like to have your view about uh, what about citizens' data, so people collected by people. You know that we have uh, the data protection regulation that is regulating, in a way, the access. And, uh, for example, on connected car, it's clearly that uh, the owner of the car should give authorization to use, uh, to use the data. So there is a potential uh, a friction between what is uh, individual interest and social interest. So what is uh, the interest of a community that can benefit from the access of the data and uh, the need to protect uh, individual for privacy reasons. So do you have some view about, about this issue? We want to comment about, uh, because this is a typical uh, dilemma, in particular in the future as far concerned application that are intensively used data, and we have Facebook example in, 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 uh, that is in front of us. Yeah, yep. Art. Um, last week, the OGC, uh, the OGC in collaboration with many organizations started a citizen science interoperability experiment just to see how we deal with those points. We don't know at this stage who we'd like to run into them. Um, and so that, uh, I think that answers that question. Let's see what happens you know, with, with the Privacy Act and, and how we can use that uh, non-authoritative data as an additional data set to that authoritative data sets that I believe the government has a monopoly on. Okay, I think that uh, this uh, concludes the round table discussion. If uh, you allow me, I would like to make some uh, final consideration about what I listen. Uh, because we have uh, in the title uh, Digital Transformation, Inspire and Digital Transition, which is the link with Inspire. And from uh, the presentation that I saw, it is clear for me uh, that uh, if uh, uh, the investment that we are making on setting up an infrastructure like Inspire uh, should be uh, maximized, in the sense that Inspire should not only look to the original purpose that was to support uh, Environmental, environmental policy might penetrate uh, more strongly in, in digital governments. And, uh, and in doing this, we should not only look <coughs> to what our public service is doing, but in the way in which public service is doing will uh, interoperate in the future with uh, citizens and with, uh, uh, with the business sector. And should incorporate uh, something that is not collected, but is collected by, by sensors. Because uh, in the smart city, you are clearly showing that in the future a lot of information will be collected by sensor, by web camera, by sensor measuring air quality, and so on. So it is important that uh, this element will be in the future fully integrated in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, and, and made operable with uh, the Inspire infrastructures. Uh, this requires also for uh, looking to an evolution of the infrastructures. Uh, some years ago, we were thinking about moving to cloud services. Now we are challenging because maybe we have already to step, uh, to make a step to move directly to edge services. But it's clearly that uh, it's something that, uh, in particular, member states have to consider in the future that the demand of information, and I like uh, from a new statement that we are completely changing our society for slow moving data to interact with data streams. Uh, this is require new, new thinking about how this data should be uh, accessible and, and managed in the future, in particular for those data that are of higher interest for other applications and can be used to develop something that is not existing today. As uh, Valerie uh, showed in his uh, presentation, there are plenty of new innovative services then can be created by uh, better using the uh, huge amount of data that uh, today are becoming available. <clears throat> we need also to, to think about uh, which is the approach that uh, we need to promote. Um, I think that in your presentation, Valérie, you were uh, emphasizing the need to be participatory and inclusive. And, and, um, and um, uh, so it's a lean. Uh, uh, Valérie instead uh, emphasized the role of human interoperability. This is quite important. So uh, today people are still not uh, understanding uh, the technology they are mastering, 
they are not aware about the risk uh, of cybercrime that they are encountering and they are exposed to quite a lot. And so there is probably a need to do something in terms of education and probably there is a call for a new education scheme, uh, system in Europe to have also digital skills in, in, every, in every citizen. So it's a cultural transformation. It's not only a transformation driven by the technology need to, uh, the technology is just a pusher, uh, it's not the solution but it's a neighbor and this neighbor should be, uh, should be mastered properly. Uh, then it's clearly that there is still a huge debate about how these data access should be ensured. It's clearly data is considered today and we have plenty of evidence that is a currency, so there is a value in the data. So the solution that I see emerging are basically two things. Uh, we exchange the data because we have a common benefit, so, or we license the data. And um, it is important to explore in, uh, if this will be enough, in particular considering that uh, uh, when people are subscribing to social media, they are not necessarily signing a license, but just give the authorization. And nobody, I think that we are asking to approve uh, the license, but I don't think that the bot is reading exactly what is, is signing. Just say, yes, I agree. Um, and then again, there is something that for me is a challenge, uh, has been mentioned by you, is what is called sectoral differences. In each sector, people are organizing themselves and try to define their own data policy, their own specification, their own data interoperability uh, arrangement. And uh, because we are living in multidisciplinary application and in a cross-sector uh, cross, uh, society, uh, it's very difficult, I can ensure, try to convince one group to change something, to adapt and to make interoperable with another group. I have recently, in a workshop, we address uh, uh, the problem of digital transformation in, in the construction sector. This is one of the more promising sectors in terms of deployment of uh, uh, device, or sensor device, and, but as well in the, in the term of use, artificial intelligence and virtual reality, it's really a, a, a very, um, not yet mature, but emerging sectors. And clearly they are not aware about the standard use or adopted by other communities, so they are inventing uh, their, own, their own solutions. And then we have the last uh, point that I take from the discussion is how the government should evolve. I have the impression that government as a platform was uh, something when a labor that was used in the past but it's clearly that maybe it's too, it's too ambitious to have government like Google, but it's clearly uh, that uh, the government should organize itself in, 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 in a better way if, uh, if we want that uh, the citizen will, will be, um, we, we, we can have uh, much better services. They are not obliged to navigate in several web services to find information that they are looking for. And again, this is, this is create a new need for capacity building in, in local government and also the need to think about, about uh, possible in investment and with uh, the current limitations. Uh, we have do, done uh, a recently a very interesting uh, study on uh, use of API in local governments. Uh, and I was quite shocked when I saw the results, how much startup were created for the fact that data were becoming easily accessible to develop application about local mobility. And then the fact that the data about the bus transportation were made accessible just create a lot of people were thinking about application dealing with, with this data. So, uh, just to conclude uh, um, with a few remarks, I think that uh, the digital transformation is, is, not a, a, an, a, um, is not comparable to the Industrial Revolution because uh, the Industrial Revolution was, if you want, affecting only uh, the industrial sector, whereas the, uh, the digital transformation is affecting everybody. So it's penetrating at the same time in the society and in the industry, it's transforming businesses. So it's much more difficult to measure which will be its impact. It's much more difficult to measure if uh, where are the jobs that will be uh, destroyed and where are the jobs that we will be created. 
And as far as I know, I have not seen a, a, an economist able to, to measure these things in, in, in a way because we don't have past example. Uh, but this can be considered uh, not uh, as, as, as an issue, but as a challenge, as an opportunity, because it's giving to us the possibility to build something that uh, is working better, is more efficient, is more close to the citizens, and is helping also Europe in, uh, in economic growth. Uh, example on digital transition are good example because they are um, putting together networks of, of different cities uh, sharing the same problems. I think that we need to promote and you also your example about uh, the European partnership of, of smart city is a good example because we need to share this experience in order to find the right solution that uh, are quite difficult to be uh, understand so far also because we are exposed by uh, potential uh, erosion of our market from the China and from, from US. So we, with, with, um, with this message about uh, the importance to, to, to continue to monitor the evolution and the uptake of uh, the digital technologies and to ensure uh, that this uh, is managed properly, I still believe that uh, data remain uh, the key issues. I still believe that uh, um, harmonization of uh, or ensuring data interoperability is the issue that we need to, uh, to continue to address, including uh, un unlocking data access and removing access for, for uh, barrier for data sharing. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. You have now a good lunch and see you in, in the afternoon.